Um, our last presenter is Matt Najati um, with ABB. So Matt is a microgrid uh, specialist. Uh, he has been uh, working in that capacity down in North Carolina, and I would say in Toronto, we're very um, pleased to welcome him back to his hometown of Toronto, um, where he's moved to take a look uh, more closely at um, microgrid sales and opportunities in Canadian markets. So welcome. Hello everyone, thanks for, uh, for having me here today to speak. Um, as the title suggests on my slide here, I'm gonna be talking about microgrids this afternoon and a little bit about how the changing landscape for renewables and storage is really affecting the solar, uh, excuse me, mining sector. Um, before I go too far into my presentation, I find it's often useful just to define microgrids. It's a term which gets used quite a lot and in a number of different contexts. So when I speak about microgrids today, I'm going to be talking about grid systems that typically involve control of multiple generation sources. Some of these might be traditional thermal generation and some might be renewable. Uh, there may or may not be energy storage in the mix or, or control over loads. And there is certainly the opportunity for both off-grid microgrids as well as grid-connected ones and uh, the potential for transition between these two states. Uh, where I'll go with this presentation today, I'm going to do a very small overview on ABB and an introduction to the organization. Um, I will note that I'm not an economist, but I'm happy to be speaking after the rest of the speakers on this panel because I think they did a great job today about speaking to the future of where renewables will be going. Um, so I will touch on economics very briefly before focusing a little bit on specifically microgrid technologies. And I'm going to end here with a business case we looked at for diesel reduction at an off-grid mine site to kind of explore what might be possible as we look to imp uh, implement microgrid technologies in this space. So ABB in Canada is headquartered in Montreal. Uh, we have 55 locations across the country. I am now based back here in Toronto, but as uh, was mentioned, I previously worked with our center of execution for microgrids, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina. ABB has been in the world of microgrids for 27 years now. Uh, 27 years ago, they weren't called microgrids. That's a relatively new term. I think 27 years ago, it was probably just diesel optimization systems. Since that point in time, the technology has been rapidly improving uh, to allow for more interesting and complex grid systems. And one kind of measure of this is renewable penetration. When I say renewable penetration, I speak to the amount of a specific load sourced from renewable generation at any point in time. If you look at that project in 1998, we were looking at wind diesel systems where kind of 40% of the load could be serviced by wind. But as we are getting better at controlling different renewable sources and implementing storage technologies as well, this has been up to systems with 100% renewable penetration. That means there's points in time where all of the load is supplied by renewables and clean energy. And that's quite exciting. The, the final example, the bottom right of this slide, is actually from a mine site, so I thought it would be good to include that here. That's from uh, a project we did last year in Australia, the Degrusa mine site with uh, UE. And that one achieved 50% renewable penetration. So again, quite exciting for the mining sector as well. In addition to those kind of four projects I mentioned, there's over 40 of them around the world today in a wide range of climates. Uh, quite a cluster in Australia, but as well in Africa, Antarctica, Alaska, so uh, well around the world. I'm going to shift pace here and, like I said, briefly touch on economics for a moment. Uh, the two plots up here don't say a whole lot, but I think there's a very clear trend which can be taken out of this, and that's that fuel prices are projected to increase in the future. What's not shown on this slide is that there's also the concept of fuel volatility, price volatility, and this impacts operations for different mine sites as well as any other heavy industry. When we think about renewables and microgrid technology, we see them as a tool for mitigating not just increasing price, but also operational price risk, as they're both they're stable in both those regards. The data I have on this slide is actually from the Next Era Energy Investor Conference from earlier this summer. 
it is well in line with the numbers presented uh, by Rachel, which is always a pleasant thing for me being up here presenting them. But it looks at a uh, levelized cost of electricity from both solar and wind, and there's quite the clear trend from 2010 through to last year, a uh, significant decrease in price. It is worth noting that these numbers you see here do include some tax credit, um, some tax credits in them and production and investment. And those are, of course, US specific. That being said, depending on the regions which you're looking at and working in, it might be possible to achieve similar uh, subsidies. If we then quickly look at lithium ion batteries, again, we see a similar trend with regards to decrease in price. And as Rachel also alluded to, uh, there is an adder we look at over just the lithium ion battery pack price for the containerization, control, and delivery of an energy storage system. That's really what you would see if you were to implement something at a project site. Uh, the trend, though, is the same. Finally, when you put this all together, you start to look at the competitiveness of renewables with an energy storage component against generation, more traditional generation, so new combined cycle gas or existing coal, for example. And while today it might only just start to become more competitive, certainly as we look to the future, we expect this to become more and more exciting and a, definitely a, a, a key option when you look at new projects. Now, a lot of my focus there on talking about kind of pricing for renewables and pricing for fuels is related to fuel and energy cost savings, and that's certainly uh, an operational goal for, uh, for mining sites. I would suggest, however, that there's other operational goals which would drive microgrid-related projects. Certainly maximizing reliability and an uninterrupted supply of electricity is very important. And I would say reducing environmental impact is becoming more and more important today. If you then shift your focus to the right-hand side of that slide, um, those are what we call the eight S's, or power system functions, which you might look to achieve from any microgrid project. Um, things like spinning reserve or load shaving or peak sh load shifting or peak shaving. And the purpose of this slide is really to show that the operational goals are what's gonna drive your microgrid projects. The power system functions are go gonna be what you hope to get out. Um, and you're going to need the right combination of microgrid technologies to achieve that. And we, there's been lots of talk today about renewable generation, solar and, and wind, and I expect that will continue through the rest of the afternoon and into tomorrow. I will, in a couple of slides here, touch a little bit more on controls and storage as additional tools in, in this path we're on. So what I'm going to look at on this slide is the introduction of a concept we're calling incremental hybridization. And that's a step approach to uh, renewable solutions and microgrid solutions. Um, I'm going to measure a number of different technology configurations, if you will, based on two performance metrics. The first is one I mentioned already, renewable penetration, referring to the amount of renewables in a grid system. Uh, the second is energy contribution, which direct, directly relates to fuel reduction. If you look at the first kind of line there, if you imagine a system with a little bit of solar in it, certainly there will be some fuel savings which can be achieved, and you might have renewable penetrations in the 20 to 30 percent range. Um, as you continue to step down the, the rows of this slide and you increase the amount of technology you're putting into these systems, First might be control of generators, for example, and then stepping into a solution where you look at, for example, forecasting of renewables. That might be a case with a Skycam, for example, where you project clouds are going to cover over my solar. It would be a good time to turn on my, my thermal generation in, in order to prevent step loading it when the clouds actually do get there and not being prepared. The real big jump here happens when you look at the next line, and that's the addition of energy storage. Um, what adding storage to this type of solution set allows you to do is achieve 100% renewable penetration. That means at periods of time you might be able to go without uh, traditional generation, assuming the renewables and storage are capable of managing the load. 
and when you enter a state in that way, that's where you're really able to get significant fuel savings. You're not running generators and spinning reserve states anymore, and you're really able to, to maximize the savings you can achieve. The last two lines of this slide really look at probably a future scenario, and it might not be economically feasible today, but we imagine there, there will be the opportunity to bring in more load management opportunities, demand management, as well as looking at upsizing solar and renewable resources to hopefully eventually reach states with 100% uh, fuel reduction and where maybe fossil fuels are only used as, uh, as backup generation or emergency generation sources. I'm going to highlight here very quickly uh, ABB's offering in the microgrid space. Uh, the first is a micro, our microgrid controller. It is a vendor independent control system and the idea being that um, it would sit with every asset in the, the microgrid and be able to dispatch those assets in a way which is economic but also reliable, ensuring the system stays online. And the second piece of it, as I said, is energy storage, and we call our energy storage solution the power store. It is a fully containerized storage solution, and while it's certainly able to act as storage and provide grid stabilization functionality, it uh, is also able to act as a virtual generator, if you will, providing voltage and frequency reference and enabling you to shut off thermal generation. I'm going to now focus here on a case study which we did looking at a remote gold mining operation. This was done to investigate potential for diesel fuel reduction. Um, the kind of metrics for our study here, it was about a 5 megawatt average load, 6.3 megawatt peak, and there was existing diesel generators at site. From the economic side, we looked at a delivered fuel cost of a dollar US per liter. Uh, two U.S. dollars per watt installed peak of solar and a cost of capital of 11 percent. Of course, these particular assumptions will not align with all of the mine sites you guys look at. I think the key message here is that this type of analysis can be done and done quite accurately to project out what is possible in this space today. But also, we can look at the sensitivities for a number of different economic variables here to determine how microgrid performance might be evaluated if uh, economic projections don't go exactly as we expect. Uh, so for the purpose of the study, we looked at four individual scenarios which increment in terms of the content for microgrid uh, technology, if you will. Uh, the first scenario was a base case which looked at the status quo operation operating the mine based on diesel only as it is today. In that scenario, you can see the red grade in box. One generator was always kept online for spinning reserve purposes. The second scenario we looked at was a diesel energy storage solution. In that one, we had the battery energy storage act as the spinning reserve or operating reserve capacity and allowed for shutting off at least one of the diesel generators. It also allowed a little bit more efficient usage of the generators. Scenario three looked at a diesel so solar solution. There it looked at up to four and a half megawatts installed solar. And of course that resulted in fuel reduction by turning off diesel generation, but it did increase the amount of spinning reserve required due to the volatile, volatile nature of um, solar and renewable generation in general. Finally, scenario four looked at the all-in scenario of doing solar diesel storage microgrid solution. And that one was sized such that it would be possible to shut off all diesel generation for periods of time during the day when the sun was shining. So when we look at the results here, I'm going to start with fuel consumption. It's typically the most interesting one. Um, in the, the base case, the, the amount of fuel used was about 11.5 million liters per year. By going to scenario two and shutting off that spinning reserve, there was a small savings, but the real savings was achieved by installing solar and then eventually solar battery, allowing up to 28% reduction in fuel usage. Uh, you see that result reflected in the levelized cost for electricity, which originally was about $304 a megawatt hour 
and that dropped about 10% as we got to the fourth scenario there. Of course, as you install more technology, solar and storage, there's investment associ associated with that. Uh, that being said, both the return on investment and payback periods were quite reasonable for this project. So then we looked at some of the sensitivities to different variables here. The four we looked at were diesel pricing, solar price installed, um, solar irradiation, and energy storage installed price. Um, and this was the impact on the cost for electricity savings which were achieved. You can see that far and away diesel price had the, the greatest impact, or fuel price in this case, had the greatest impact on cost savings. To a lesser extent, solar was relevant, and battery pricing actually had very small impact in the overall financial performance of this project. We can take a slightly deeper look at both diesel and solar pricing now, and it's done across three different figures here. Uh, starting on the left, looks at the optimal solution sizing. And if you look in the top left corner there, that's a scenario with very expensive diesel and inexpensive solar. And you can see that the optimal solution is quite a large battery and solar plant installation. Subsequently, if you look over at the fuel reduction and LCOE reduction plots, um, the, the large system size resulted in quite um, strong numbers in terms of fuel and cost for electricity savings. At the same time, if you look at the bottom right corner for all of these figures, that represents a scenario where solar pricing remains quite high and the, the cost for diesel is quite low. Even in that scenario where there was no solar installed, we still were able to achieve a small reduction in uh, both fuel and cost for electricity savings, so still, still some positive results in any case. Finally here, it's always nice to talk about modeling, but it's much more interesting to talk about real results. Uh, so I have a few different projects up here to demonstrate what's being achieved in terms of fuel reductions today. Uh, the first project on the left is the one that I mentioned earlier, uh, the Degusa Mine site. That one we're just getting kind of a full data set on still, but we're looking at potential savings of diesel fuel in the range of about 20% there. Um, if you then shift over and look in the center section there, those were a couple of remote community projects. So different load profile certainly, but similar technology solution. Uh, and we looked at potential fuel savings there, or excuse me, not potential, that's actual data uh, for the past seven years in the 35 to 40% range. Finally, the last project on the right is from a manufacturing facility in Johannesburg. And that, again, project went up last year. It is a grid-tied facility, but with a very poor utility connection. And they've been able to achieve not just a 50% reduction in their utility cost, but also in the fossil fuel they were using for backup generation every time they got shut off from the utility. So exciting that we're able to see these fuel reductions carry forward into real projects. I'm gonna wrap up here with a little bit of a summary. I think the status quo for uh, off-grid mines today is that diesel or gas generation is the primary source for electricity. Um, but certainly with the reduction in cost for renewables and storage in the last few years, uh, significant fuel reductions can be achieved in a way that's economically feasible. I think if renewable pricing continues to go the way we have seen and the way we project it to go, in the next few years, we will see a very clear business case towards moving to even further implementation of microgrid technologies in the mining sector. And that certainly uh, an incremental approach is possible and feasible for these types of projects, regardless of where you are um, on this spectrum, if you will. ABB is happy to support our mining customers as they move towards a, a lower carbon and a lower energy cost future. Thank you.